Hey guys, brand new podcast. Hey guys, brand new podcast. Hey guys, I'm on tour. I'm on tour. I'm leaving to go shoot Go Big Show. Big surprises there. Uh, tomorrow? No, no, no. Sunday. And then I'm on tour. September 8th, I am at Red Rocks. Just so you know, I've acquired mushrooms to watch Jimmy Buffett. They will be. <laughs> I'm going to watch Jimmy Buffett on the 9th, and I will be eating mushrooms. Your I'm tweet so- worked. <laughs> I'm so, my tweet worked. I got so many mushrooms. I watched this great podcast, this great show. Okay, let's do tour dates and then I'll tell you all about it. September 8th, I'm at Red Rocks, Morrison, Colorado. There are a few tickets left. We've just added seats. Uh, The Park Theater at the Mirage in Las Vegas, September 25th, Montgomery, Alabama. Augusta, Georgia, Charleston, West Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Where are my Florida dates? Are my Florida dates not on here? Oh, here we go. Green Bay, Wisconsin, Peoria, Illinois, Su- Sioux City, Iowa, Tampa, Florida, Tampa, Florida, Tampa, Florida. We got three shows in Tampa, Florida. We got three shows in Orlando, Florida. I'm going to the fucking Florida State game Saturday. I'm going to fu- I'm going to fucking get myself from Orlando to St- Tallahassee that Saturday morning. I'm going to watch the game and then I'm going to get myself back to Orlando for that show that night. Then I'm going back to Tallahassee to do a show for the first time in 24 years. I will be in Tallahassee at the Donald L. Tucker Civic Center, October 24th. The Florida Theater in Jacksonville, we'll go surfing that day. We're going to probably go uh, spearfishing during the week before the Hollywood, Florida shows or the Fort Myers shows. Two shows in Fort Myers. I'm going to get to hang out with that dude from, uh, from, from, what's McGraw that I like so much? Anyway, the tour dates are up at burrburrburr.com. They go all the way through New Year's Eve, they go through April, really. And I'm on tour. I can't fucking wait to see you on tour. We, I am, I am vaccinated and ready to fucking party. We're going old school. We did it over at uh, the Borgata. We got loose. And by the way, didn't have a cough, didn't have a fever, and I can still taste barbecue. So we're good, man. Let's get down. I can't wait. I'm not going to be the fucking one to tell you what's, what to do about fucking your life. So let's just party. That's all I give a fuck about. This cast comes off today. I can't fucking wait. Have we talked about my surgery? No, I got surgery last week. I, I think you probably heard it on my podcast with Leanne. You will definitely hear it on two podcasts with Tom. I start to spiral a little bit the day before surgery and Tom starts fucking with me, showing me his surgery. We start talking about the death odds and I was a tight wound cunt. I was really fucking shitty to Leanne. I got into fights with her. It was not perfect, not ideal, but I'm out of it. I get my cast off today. I got my stitches out today. I got my brace on today and it's all about recovery. If there's one thing this kid can do, it's recover. I'm good at the fucking next morning punishing yourself to get yourself better. I'm good at that. I'm not good. I'm not good with emotions. I'm not good with anxiety. I'm not good at I like. There's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I'm honest as fuck. And trust me when I say that honesty comes back to bite you in the ass sometimes. Whew. But fuck it. That's the horse I rode in on, right? So let's just be honest. Let's be very honest. Dude, I saw one of the best podcasts I've seen in a long time. Joe Rogan. Look, Joe Rogan always hits dingers, right? He's got a podcast? He's got a podcast. He just started, I think. Oh, and good for I think him. He's in, I think he's in Waco, Texas. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mostly um, a comedy podcast, but every now and then he'll talk about some, uh, some you know, hot button topic issues. You think he'll have you on ever? I hope so. I'd like to befriend him and maybe do his podcast. Um, <laughs> by the way, uh, the uh, I, I, I haven't done this podcast in a long time. I, I, well, I guess I did it a year ago, right before COVID. But you haven't been to Texas, right? I haven't been to Texas yet. Wait, which podcast did you like of his? The one with the fucking North Korean uh, dissident. Uh, did you listen to it? Yeah. Holy shit. Andrew heard it. Yeah. Andrew's in the back. He's in the other room. Dude. First of all, what that woman, uh, Park is her last name. Her first name is Leo, Leonie, Leomia, Leomia. I think I'm saying it right. I Googled her because uh, she has such a fascinating story. And, and what's amazing is how different. Someone tagged me. I think it was Chase Lepard tapped, tagged me in a, in a thing. And she was talking about Kim Jong-un's lifestyle. By the way, me and Kim Jong-un would be fucking... We're very similar. I think he'd meet me and go, you are my spirit animal. And I'd be like, yeah, I think so. But man, the life over in North Korea is 
unimaginable. You have to listen to that podcast to get a little perspective on how good you have it. Go to your refrigerator, get yourself a fucking ice cold beer and listen to this podcast. And and halfway through that beer, you're going to feel guilty about all the shit you have around and how little they have in North Korea. I mean, halfway through the podcast, I was like, I was like, how do we not invade that country and free those people? She didn't even know what a white person was. She, this is such a good fucking podcast. What's her name? Wow. Yami Park. Yami Park. It, it is such a good podcast. And and Rogan did such a great fucking job. I almost texted him and then I was like, eh, I bet a lot of people text him about, I never texted him about a podcast before. Like I've never been like, great job on your podcast. Well, by the way, Oh, he's texted me before. I should maybe text him. It was fucking an amazing podcast. On the flip side, today I have Sebastian Maniscalco on. Like, we're not breaking any fucking codes. We're not going to break down any barriers. But Sebastian is the funniest motherfucker working. He is killing it. He's doing a full-blown arena tour. He just did two nights at the Ryman. Uh, he's, I mean, he's sold out. He sold out a new venue in in Mad- in in New York city so quickly, they added a show at the Barclays center in Brooklyn. He's killing it. And, and you know, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're the last two comedians in Los Angeles. So we've gotten very close and uh, we're very different men. It's really interesting to be around him, to hear his perspective. Cause if I, the idea that I'm barefoot, I I'm always barefoot. I love being barefoot. I grew up in fucking Florida. He grew up in Chicago. He is, uh, it's so funny because my daughters know Sebastian, no, not know him, but they know Sebastian. And we were at the Borgata and these, these Italian couple got in the elevator and he was talking. He's like, yo, 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 Tina, I say we go down, we get some meatballs, you know, a little bang, 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 go out, you know? And my daughters were like, uh, they got out of the elevator and they're like, those were Italians. And I was like, you've never met an Italian before? And they're like, not like a real one. I go, what about Sebastian? And they go, he's Italian. I was like, what the fuck? But it's a great podcast. You're going to absolutely love it. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for checking it out. Check me out on tour. Uh, check out Two Bears, One Cave. Check out Bill Burt. Check out Leanne's podcast. We did a great podcast with Miss Pat that's coming out in, a, I think, next week, maybe. A couple weeks, yeah. I think when whenever her, she's got a new show on BET+. Plus. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're fine-tuning everything, getting everything streamlined so we can put out a bunch of content to keep you occupied for the second coming lockdown when the, the country shuts down and us great Americans put masks on again and listen to people that don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Didn't I just say I wasn't going to talk about this? Yep. Didn't I just say I was going to talk about this? Mm-hmm. Not my fucking face over my dead hands. What is it? What is that? How do you say taking your guns away? Pry my, cold dead. Pry my mask from my cold, dead teeth. Mm-hmm. I wear a mask if I go outside. I wear it on a plane. I'm a fucking hypocrite. I got vaccinated. Johnson and Johnson, son. <laughs> hey, let's run through some jokes that I wrote lately to see if you guys find them funny. I wrote suck a dick by proxy. That's based off a joke where I found out that uh, this girl I made out with sucked Sean Hooker's dick before earlier in the night. Um, I only see the top of my dick. That's an interesting angle. Sometimes comedy's in the smallest things. Well, okay, this is a good. You want to hear a really good story? Mm-hmm. Okay, this is. A, this is a, by the way, I, I'm going to bring back uh, solo podcasts. Oh yeah, I'm going to bring back solo podcasts or or or, or what call it, and have you and Andrew in here, kind of just to talk to me, and and we'll do. I think we should do some of those. So those are. I think this is a fun energy sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I listen too much on my podcast and I just don't get a time to shine. You know, same thing mm-hmm. with Two Buyers, One Cave. I listen so much to what Tom's saying that, quite honestly, I don't feel like I get a voice. Um, <laughs> so sometimes comedy is in the smallest look, right? In the smallest look. So I tore, I, I, I was on this show trip flip with this guy, uh, State King. It's State King. You know State King, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Paul is one of my best friends. I love Paul to death. Paul's a lot like me. We partied hard. And I remember waking up one morning and he goes, and I go, my, my blood pressure is out of control today. I'm certain of it. And he goes, he goes, oh, double up on your blood pressure medicine. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah, that's what you do. If you party hard, just take an extra pill the next day. I said, for real? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad's a doctor. Trust me. So, uh, so I start doing that and I start not worrying about my blood pressure at all. And then, and then I fell off a waterfall. Uh, I fell off a waterfall. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I, I'm, and, 
And as I fell, I got down and I said to Paul, <laughs> who's my producer, I said, what happened? And he goes, I guess the guy wasn't watching you. <laughs> I go, wasn't he supposed to? And he goes, yeah, I don't know. I was changing a battery on my camera. <laughs> and then I said, can we get me hella, hella vacked out of here? And he goes, yeah. And he calls up and he goes, no, it turns out they're, they're not, they can't do a helivac out of this canyon. It's 210 feet deep. They can't get a helicopter in here. It's too narrow. So it looks like you're gonna have to crawl out. And I was like, are you, are you being serious? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we get to the top of the trailhead. I finally crawl my way out and the medics are there and they take my blood pressure and they go, his blood pressure is 170 over 120. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, have you been taking your blood pressure medicine? And I said, well, yeah, lately I have. Well, lately I've been doubling it up. Paul's sitting right there. I go, I've been doubling it up because I, I sometimes I'll, I feel like I'm partying too hard. And the woman goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You're never supposed to double up your medication. And I said, what? She goes, don't ever start self-prescribing your, who told you how to, who told you to do this? And I look at Paul, he very calmly shrugs his shoulders and goes, oh, I'm over three today. <laughs> oh my God. Oh shit! You okay? <laughs> I uh, sometimes comedy is in that in that moment, that moment that just it makes you giggle and fucking made me giggle so fucking hard. Oh, I'm over three today. God, my almost just passed out. Did you see that? Yeah, I almost like just passed out. Burp cough fit. Good God! All right, let's start the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Without further ado, stand-up comedian, actor, host of his own show on Discovery Plus called Well Done. I was on an episode. We had steaks. It was fucking amazing. My friend, father, husband, comedian, Italian, Sebastian Maniscalco. Dude, I just need this. I need to get on that plane to Serbia and be done. And once I get on the plane to Serbia, I'm good. I, but, are you leaving this week? Next Monday. Wow. Next, yeah, Monday in a week. So what's the, what's your feelings on all this? Are you excited, nervous? I'm very or? fucking nervous. What's what got you nervous? Just doing a big movie like this, or yeah, this will come out after we've announced the movie, right? Yeah. yeah okay, we can roll. We'll talk. I can talk about it. Okay. I think, and then just edit. Make sure we can clip it out if they don't want us to. You know, I, I've been in this business doing my comfort zone for so long. Just stand up hosting podcast, stand up hosting podcast. That's it. And I just gave my daughters this huge speech about, I just gave them this huge speech about success and why certain people are successful. And that if you don't challenge yourself by making yourself uncomfortable, if you need to put yourself into situations where you're uncomfortable, if you do that enough, then every situation you, you come in front of, you're going to be ready to chat, take it on as a challenge because you, you enjoy the uncomfort. And I loved it when we were younger and being a comic and, Fuck it, I'll do any show. Put me on any time. I don't care. Yeah, I want to do that. I'll do that. And then you get older and you get in your comfort zone. And you're like, you're like, God damn it, I shouldn't have given that speech. <laughs> what was the last thing you did where you were uncomfortable? Where you were like nervous? Uncomfortable, nervous. Uh, well, this show that I'm coming off, I was uncomfortable just because I've, uh, it, it was a, a food comedy show I hosted, doing interviews, never done anything like that before. And I think it's like we build it up in our head that, oh, new thing. Can I do this? Is it going to be funny? But then after you do it, you're like, why was I so worried about it? Like, uh, yeah. you know, you're going to go off and do this movie. And uh, I'm sure you're, you're, it's something you've never done before. And you're, I don't know, I don't know what's going through your head right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have so much. Honestly, what's going through my head is, Bert, you cannot party your fucking balls off on an average night and wake up hungover. Like, cause I, I did that last night. I drank, I started drinking at like 11 o'clock yesterday, having a cigar, really treating myself. I had nothing to do, no workout. And I woke up this morning with like piss sweats going like, what the fuck are you doing? And I knew I had a workout. I got this. I got a the consultation with my daughter's, uh, what you call it? I got a doctor's appointment. I got another podcast with Eddie Ift at four. I know I'll be drinking on that one. I got to give notes for the script. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? You got shit to do. Like you can, and I literally, I was like, you need to put yourself in check there. I don't want to not drink like that's, and that's where my fucking brain is. The simplest thing. I was actually thinking of you this morning going, does Sebastian ever wake up and go, fuck, I don't feel good today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, believe me. I've had that many a times, but I'm just uh, fascinated on 
You got two podcasts and you know already. You're, three, three. Oh, three today? No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, two today. Yeah, two today. Yeah. So you're doing Eddie yeah. Ift, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you know you're drinking on that one? And what, today, uh, this one you're not drinking? I know, but I just know that that's not you. So I, I, I get comfortable. Oh, okay. Like you're just a regular adult. <laughs> and then, but like you also don't have anything to prove. Like you're, you're just like, I could do the podcast. Like, and then when Eddie comes on, I think, you know, Eddie's got a special he's trying to promote. He's got an album, I think, that just came out. And so Eddie will want to go hard in the paint. Sometimes you can feel the energy before a podcast when someone's like, I'm ready to fucking, I want to go hard. Like, uh, go hard with, 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 with the drinking. Yeah. Because they know that if like, if, if we drink on the podcast, the fucking numbers are always better because people say a lot of regretful things. Oh God. Yeah. I've said, so I was thinking of that of you today. I was like, Sebastian does not have a body of work in podcasting that's 10 years long of him just getting wasted and high and <laughs> laughing at green lighting inappropriate jokes <laughs> i was like you're so fucking lucky i look i sit in panic sometimes going what have i laughed at <laughs> like not what have i said what have i laughed at like segura said some horrible stuff to me and i know that i'll be the one that go, they go but look the way he's enjoying it <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. Where where you got a question now, your your laughter, right? I mean, I, first we 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 have, and I don't even know if this has been brought up on your cast before. And I know we're we're in your home. Yeah, and that's that's no secret, right? Yeah, right. Have you always done the podcast barefoot? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I actually have. <laughs> I think I've done a lot of. I don't like shoes. I'm not a shoe guy. So you were the kid that grew up in uh, walking around um, barefoot, barefoot in the street. That oh guy? yeah, oh hardcore. Okay, speedo, barefoot. That was it. That was in the summer. Put on a speedo, be barefoot the whole summer. All right. Well, I guess the Florida vibe kind of gives you that like uh, freedom. Oh, a bear. You know? I I go places barefoot that I don't realize you're not supposed to go barefoot. Like where you, someone's like, well, I you can't just walk into a store barefoot. And I'm like, in Florida, you can. You definitely can in Florida. Or and and I'm if I'm not barefoot, I'm definitely wearing flip flops. All right, I was wondering where that came from because I always see you walking around barefoot, and I'm like, is this guy just got a, like a, a sweat problem with with the <laughs> socks and shoes? Well, I, you know, and also I get a little OCD about getting like when you buy nice shoes, and then if you walk around in dirt, then you kind of ruin nice shoes as opposed to I wear I like good shoes for stage, like nice shoes, but I want them clean. So like I I have stage shoes that I travel with in a bag that I don't, I only wear, I only put on, and like, I won't walk in the snow in them. Like I'll wear other shoes into the theater, put my shoes on. Well, I just like the pristineness of it. Well, speaking of shoes, I was kind of upset when I when I arrived here today that um, I wasn't really made aware that this is a full blown construction site, and I, I would have wore my construction boots. <laughs> I was uh, I was wondering; those are nice shoes. Which shoes are those? Tom Ford. Uh, Tom Ford. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would have wore I would have wore something a little bit more aggressive. <laughs> I'm walking through rocks out there. I know, right? I'm walking barefoot. <laughs> wait. So wait. When was the? So when you did Green Book. Uh, let's i'm just gonna say green book because i think that's more accessible for me because I've, I've watched that a couple times um were you nervous getting on set oh yeah no that was first really kind of big movie i did i've done like a little handful of movies where i just pop in and pop out yeah but this was actually a, a little role i had and then i'm i'm with vigo mortensen so you know i don't i'm not a thespian you know i mean i've taken acting you're a good class. actor you're a good actor well thanks but i mean i'm i'm not you know it's not something that i'm like trained in or what have you i've I've taken classes in the past and i take classes if i have a role or a private coach or what have you but you know i i didn't know what to expect when i walked on the set because i'm working with people who are you know veterans and 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 you know masters of their craft so yeah you're walking into that situation you know, I just, the unknown, that's what I don't like. Yeah. Plus when you walk into a movie and it's like in the middle of the movie, like they've been shooting already for 20 days. Oh. I never was a good, a good like a first day of school at a new school type of guy, uh, making buddies and I friends. Was horrible at that. You were? I, I would was th I think it would be the life of the party. No, I was, I, I'm very shy, oddly enough. Like I'm very like reserved. My first day of first grade, I cried the entire first day in the front of the class, holding the teacher's hand, sobbed, looking at the other kids. What if our parents don't come home? What if they don't bring us home? 
Like I'm not, and I'm not, I, I think my personality is a little bigger to compensate for that insecurity. You know, I think, I don't know, but uh, I, that would freak me out if they were all, all had been doing a movie for a month and then I rolled in, yeah. everyone's busting balls and you're just sitting there going. Yeah. That's kind of what, where my head was. I was like, okay, how am I going to insert myself into this project and, you know, get, pick up where these people have been, you know, they knew each other for 20 days and now I'm the new guy in town. So yeah, I was nervous, but they were great. You know, Peter Farrelly, the director was really uh, welcoming Vigo. He, he, he slapped me in the face on one of the takes, uh, the first take. And then he came back, he goes, Hey man, was, was that okay? That I did that. I go, bro, you can body slam me. <laughs> Do whatever you want. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> So <laughs> you'd be shocked what I won't mention to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was really, really cool movie to be a part of. Learned a lot uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that was just a little, you know, brick in the foundation for other movies to come. You know, you kind of yeah. learn and then take it into um, other movies. What's Vigo Mortensen like? He seems like he'd be like a cool dude cool dude again not the type of guy myself like uh to be hanging around with the cast really uh when they yell cut you know i'll, I'll you know i'm there yeah. uh but i'm not mr social i'll kind of like again this is this just goes back to, to school at, 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 you know at recess i was the kid that never said hey can i play with you I was, <laughs> i've never said that in my life <laughs> I envy kids that can say that. I envy people back in the day when we had phones or when we had cameras who would hand you a camera and go, can you take a picture of me? <laughs> that makes me fucking cringe. I did it one time. One time I've, I've asked someone to take a picture of me. I was at the Grand Canyon and, and, uh, and I was, and I was by myself. I was with uh, Bobby Kelly, Matt Frost and Vincent Nastry. And the, we were with each other, but I was with myself and I thought, I'm going to make myself uncomfortable. I'm going to go ask someone to take a picture of me. I'm going to take a picture by myself. So I get asked this lady, can you take a picture of me? She said, yes. And she took a picture of me. And I was douche chills, nervous, like, like, oh. And then we asked the same lady to take a picture of all of us. <laughs> and I realized she didn't have the grand canyon in the picture she was her back was to the grand canyon and she was just taking a picture of us at the gift shop and then matt frost goes maybe we could have the grand canyon in the background and i went fuck my only picture of myself is with the gift shop <laughs> um so wait when they yell cut you just go i'm going home no no i um you know i again i it takes me i'm like a souffle it takes a while <laughs> You know, I, to get to, you know, talking and I'm nice, but I, I don't kind of seek out conversation, uh, which is a weakness of mine, which I wish I had a little bit more of an outgoing person. My, my wife, my wife will talk to anybody. Very outgoing. And uh, yeah, smiling and always like welcoming. And my uh, kind of, I don't want to call it a loner, but uh, just a little bit more guarded could be misconstrued as, uh, you know, like I don't want to talk to anybody. It's just that I'm, I'm like you, I'm a shy guy. But so, because so when I'm with someone and they're not talking, I get very nervous. And it's almost like I hear, that's why I talk so much, I think, is that I feel like if I'm around someone who doesn't talk, I just start yammering on. Because I get uncomfortable when someone's talk, talk, not talking. Do you get uncomfortable? No, like a guy like you, right? Yeah. Actually, we were talking about this after you did the show. Uh, I was talking to Lana. I said, Bert's the type of guy, when he's talking, you're just listening, which I have no problem doing. There's some people that will try, and maybe you could, you could uh, talk to this, will try to out-talk you. Right. Yeah. Because there's no there's no um, there's no surprise here that in this conversation, you are the more outgoing, talkative one, which I I realize that. And then I will take a step back. I'm like a I'm like a chameleon. <laughs> I adapt to the situation. So <laughs> if I'm around people who love to talk, I, I don't say much. Really? Yeah, I, I don't feel like I, I need to like, okay, they're on, 
this is, this is, and I'll just step back. I, I don't need to compete for the attention. Oh, I, this is going to sound really bad. I don't need to compete for the attention. I know that it's mine. <laughs> I have said to Leanne, why are you letting her talk? She's not interesting and she's crazy. Let me talk and it'll be a fun time. Like I can orchestrate the conversation. We on our first date, second date, like a double date. She, I said, I got in the car and I went, that was fucking awesome. And she goes, well, yeah, for you. I go, what do you mean? She goes, you talked the whole time. You didn't let anyone else talk. I go, oh, they're boring people. She goes, what do you mean they're boring people? I go, they're good people, but they're just, she's crazy. And he's going to agree with everything she says. And so what am I going to fucking let her talk? It, like you couldn't tell. I, I go, honestly, I felt like she, whatever story she was telling, I almost felt like she was telling it to us for no reason at all. It was like a crazy story. And I thought she was going to cry. And she goes, well, we don't know because she never kind of worded edgewise. So we went on a second double date with him. She started to tell the same story. Oh, God. And she started sobbing, crying, sobbing, crying at an Indian restaurant. <laughs> and I looked at Leanne and I was like, do you want me to save the day? Because I can get us out of this. And she was, I was like, or we can wallow in this. And because this is what you fucking wanted. I mean, I, like there are certain people I love to listen to. Um, but if it's like we're talking about pedestrians and we're at a dinner party, I mean, you're in. I'm, and I can, by the way, I'm, I'll take one step further. If I hear someone telling a bad story, I'll fix the story for them. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, listen, I'll let a bad score, story go. I won't save it at all. I can save it for them. I, I've done it. <laughs> I've, I wanted to do a podcast called Let Me Tell You Your Story. And because people will tell me a story and then I'll go, hey, in the future, this is how you should tell it. And they'll be like, what? I mean, trust me, you're giving us a lot of information that you think is important, but it's not important to the story. Yeah. Can, I've done it to Tom Segura. I've told I've told him his stories back to him. And he's like, none of that happened. I go, but it's a better story. Like, just stick with that one. He's like, yeah, but I, that's not how it went. I went, but does it matter? Like, everyone's having a good time. You're in and out of there. You just told a killer story. Everyone's like, God damn it. That's fucking crazy. You found his wallet and then, fuck you. Your dad was right about you. Like, <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah, I, I believe that a lot of people tell stories and that story could be condensed oh. uh at least 50 to 60 percent and without you know a lot of the unneeded information uh that's why a lot of the times you know you hang out with comedians you're spoiled because the stories are so ripe and so good and you know generally speaking they're very entertaining and then you start hanging out with people who, you know, are not, you know, not comedians. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but the, the stories don't have the, yeah, the flavor. And you're just sitting there going, oh. <laughs> like, and I, it's you're right. We're spoiled in that, in that, and it's not. I mean, I don't know what things will be like when things open up now, but you know, a year ago, you'd go into the green room and you'd hang out with the most interesting, funniest, best telling a story motherfuckers in the world i mean norm mcdonald telling a story to you is one of the most captivating just you just he is a masterful storyteller and and then you go out on a double date and you're like Ugh, this guy's not bringing the thunder yeah, yeah. i had norm mcdonald telling me bill clinton stories last night <laughs> smoking weed and fucking everyone's on the ground crying laughing yeah once you're uh, once you're used to that and you you can't really hear other stories. Do you and Lana have like a, a pacing? Like, like, do you guys like, cause I've noticed the older Leanne and I have gotten the more like bitty we've, the character we've gotten, like I'm the crazy guy. She like, but it was never that way when we first started dating, but it's turned into that. Like, yeah, with Lana and I, this is kind of what's bothering me about uh, our yin and yang if we're around a group of people, she'll go tell the story about that, 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 right? Which I never like. I never like prompt stories. I like to, I like to read the room to see if they're ready for a story. <laughs> but sometimes I'll, I'll appease her. I said, okay, yeah, no, I'll tell her. So I start telling the story and then she'll jump in to add like color comment or take over the story. So she, yeah. she hijacks the story and 
I told him, I go, listen, I kind of do this for a living. I kind of <laughs> know the beats. I kind of know, you know, where to put the, you can't just keep jumping in because when you jump in, it, it, it you know, it, it throws the flow off. Yeah. So uh, that seems to be something new in our relationship. That didn't really happen in the beginning, but I think as you grow older, yeah. you think you got like the same mind. And uh, a lot of the times it's just like, babe, come on. I mean, <laughs> just let me do this. Leanne will cock block my stories. She'll go, that didn't happen. And I go, hold on, easy. So I'm just saying, it was a Thursday. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Thursday, Friday, it doesn't matter. She goes, well, yeah. it was a Thursday. I go, well, it just, it's better if it's a Friday. Cause then it's, we, we knew the weekend was coming up. And if I said Thursday, they'd be like, well, you had one more day. Well, I just, let me say Friday. It doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those little things like it doesn't like, doesn't matter in the telling of the story. Like Lana will tell a story. And like you were saying before, give a lot of information that's really not needed to propel the story to where it needs to go. And I don't know. This is just listen. We we doing this for a living. We kind of yeah. know. We kind of know what to cut out, what to add in, and to expect anybody else to do that might be a little bit more. Uh, uh, I don't know. I used to say it was like Leanne would. It was like she ripped five pages out of a book and then started reading them, expecting you to get the whole book. And you're like, wait, there was a whale. Hold on. Wait, why? Why was this guy obsessed with a whale? Wait, who's going on? Who's Ahab? I don't know. I'm I'm not following. I found, I feel like, I, f I feel like, uh, how old were you? You got married? How old was I? I'm 47. So is it 10 years or 37? So you got married pretty young yeah. still. 38. 38. Started yeah. having kids right away. Uh, I had a kid five years ago or four years ago. So what am I? 43. Yeah, no, this is late. And compared to my friends back home. Oh I mean, yeah. I mean, they got mid teens. So I got a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old. So I'm like, really? I mean, look at you. You you are like my friends. You have two kids. One's going to go to college in a year. Yeah. Uh, that's basically my buddies back home. So I'm I'm uh, I'm late to the game. It's it's interesting watching you do it though, because you're doing it at the right time. Like we did it broke, and it was that's tough. It was uh, I I. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to do it ever, any other way, but I would have liked to. It, there was a lot of insecurities I had when we'd go to like, because we always put the money in the right place. So we put the girls in good schools and then you'd be around parents that had money. And I remember one time uh, we were going to school with, um, it was a lot of famous people at this school. And Billy Crudup was uh, one of the dads. Coolest guy in the fucking world, by the way, for the record. Coolest guy in the fucking world. And... Uh, one of the parents took pictures of him. I guess he was dating someone who wasn't, he was having an affair or something. And like, no one knew about it, but we knew about it at the school. But like, he was married to the lady that did weeds, but they, he was hooking up with someone else. I don't know. I wasn't mm -hmm. really following. And I'm not great with celebrity. I kind of only knew who Billy Crudup was because he was in that Steve Prefontaine movie. And uh, so one of the parents took pictures of him and sold it to TMZ. Oh, it's serious. And they thought it was me because I was broke they're like well it had to be bert he had a camera i go i had a camera because i have a child here someone like said something to me and then i mean like it was like it was a i mean so many famous people at that school like uh billy crudup it's his wife the i don't know her name but she's like a famous person um uh fred savage i got in trouble because i said made a joke about fred savage because it's fucking fred savage like I understand he's a dad at our school, but also you grew, we grew up with that guy, yeah. right? And he was on the ground playing with the kids, and and he was like, he's really is a good dad. He's like a legit good dad. It's not part of the joke, but this is a good dad. He's a good dad, and uh, all the moms were fawning over him. He wasn't doing anything special, by the way. He was just playing with his kid. Yeah, and all the moms were fawning over him because it's Fred Savage. That's why they were doing it like they didn't do it to me i i played with my kids and they weren't like that guy's great but they're like he is such a great dad like he is really an exceptional dad like and i'm sitting there going like all right whatever and then i just go it's pretty crazy considering who his dad is and they're like what i like like his dad you know his his dad and they're no. like no i go randy the macho man savage and they're like that's his dad and i go yeah he's a showbiz kid you knew he's a showbiz kid right and they're like i did know that Oh my God. And I was like, yeah, the beautiful Elizabeth is his mom and Randy the Macho Man <laughs> Savage. And then it like, 
everyone started saying that at school and then someone pulled me aside and they're like hey man you can't like talk shit about <laughs> parents and i was like i was like it's a joke and they're like yeah but i would have loved to i like i saw what you guys did yesterday for easter and it's so nice like to be able to like it, it just seems like you're doing it right i know that sounds crazy but like i heard adam carolla one time say and by the way paraphrasing if adam didn't say this then i'm crazy but he said it's borderline child abuse if you live with more than one child in an apartment and God. i had two in an apartment at that time and i was like oh fuck <laughs> well you know there's a silver lining there because when you have kids and you're struggling the kids know the struggle you know they they don't know all this they didn't grow up what you have going on here and uh, you know the beautiful home and you know there's there's no struggle yeah. but but they've been there with you through the struggle so you didn't really have to like like i'm creating struggle now uh you know i have to interesting i have to uh i got my kid doing chores for and she's almost four so make the bed uh we went around the house and looked at what lights need to be replaced so she would point out the lights and i would write okay in the kitchen we need a light just to and then at the, at sunday i give her two dollars say good job and then maybe the next sunday i give her a dollar because you missed making your i'm trying to like instill it because i grew up yeah that's crazy because you didn't grow up like you live now no and that's a struggle for me because i just like i thought i had a really nice childhood i you know middle class upbringing northwest suburbs of chicago we went uh on one vacation a year uh you know we talked around the table. It was just nice. And like in my head, I want to like give that to my kids, but which we are trying to do. But like yesterday, what ref Bert's referring to is, and, and Alana grew up on, yeah. on the, on the uh, wealthy side of, of uh, life. So, you know, for her, this, this is, you know, getting a, a petting zoo at the house you know, we had a couple rabbits and some lamb yesterday yeah. at the house, right? Which I know is ridiculous in my head. No, it's actually not. <laughs> and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. Because it's not that expensive. It really isn't that expensive. No, it's not. We've we've done, uh, They that was a big thing when when you got kids is to bring over, like, they'll bring over animals. And we we did it for whatever reason. Isla always wanted snakes and lizards. And so <laughs> ours was always snakes and lizards. But it's not crazy, but... Um, I definitely did it when I had, like, I didn't do it when they were run, young, young, young. We were, we were broke, but when you have a, enough money that where you can afford mortgage or something like that, it's not that much of an, it's not that much of a splurge. And I saw it and I went, oh, that's fucking, of course you're an adult. You would want to do that. Yeah. It was great. The kids went in, they petted, they learned, they, they learned about the animals. What's this, what's that. And it was, it was nice for them. But again, it's a really big contrast from my easter mornings yeah. growing up and by the way when you woke up on easter morning as a kid did you hide plastic eggs or the eggs you painted uh plastic eggs were hidden and there were clues to find your basket so each plastic egg had a note and it would say uh uh bert leaves all his stuff here and then everyone would be like oh where is it where is it laundry room laundry room he dumps it on. and then all his kids oh. would run over and then it would be like uh uh arfer We'll never see a duck here. And you're like, what? Like, so it would be clues about our family. Mm. And then you'd go around and then you'd ultimately find your Easter basket. That oh, was how we did it. That's a good idea. I, I think I was in the minority because we hid the eggs that we painted. There was no plastic eggs growing so up. So you hid cooked eggs? <laughs> yeah, cooked <laughs> eggs around the house. And each cooked egg that you found had a clue to where the next egg was. Oh. We already got the basket. Basket was delivered in the room okay then we went to go how find many kids eggs. how many kids just me and my sister okay so um yeah it would be like we'd open the stove like the eggs were in the stove I and mean, we're like <laughs> four and five opening up a, a stove and then you would see the egg and you're like the next egg similar to you like the next egg is somewhere even hotter than the stove so we like ran to the fireplace and yeah were like in there so but now we do plastic eggs with candy it's just in the yard that's what we do now yeah we, they're yeah. not in the house it's it's outside and they're not even hidden they're like <laughs> it's very easy to find <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember looking for eggs it was like a two-hour 
experience <laughs> growing up. Where's the last one? You know, it Ooh. was difficult to find them. Now they're out in the open. It was so much fun. I'm not even lying. I my last Easter egg. Ba- First of all, my last Easter egg basket was, basket was my senior year in high school. Like I got Easter egg baskets up until oh, senior oh, yeah. in high school. But our last. I still kind of believe in the Easter Bunny. I was a freshman in high school. I mean, we were like, I, it was so much fun. My si- little sister, Cotty, was probably uh, four at the time. She's 10 years younger than me. And so it was like, it, it was fuck. I had so much fun doing that shit. I didn't grow up with money. I mean, there was money in my family. Like I had an uncle that had money. But my dad, um, he got he was uh, was a lawyer, and then he got this big client. The Church of Scientology was a big client, and they put him on retainer. So all of a sudden, he had money, right? So he built this brand new house and built the house, and we're all ready to move into it. And they dropped him as their lawyer, and we oh, had God. no money. We didn't couldn't furnish the house. We had like one room was furnished. We had our bedrooms were furnished, and one room was furnished, and that was it. And then like things would show up. Like I remember getting a kitchen table and being like, all right, we got a kitchen table. But I mean, all through high school, there were three rooms in the house that had no furniture in them. And you just didn't, you just, those are the rooms you played in. Yeah. But so I, but I feel like I grew up with privilege, you know, like I got a car, but I can get the car I wanted, but I got a car. Right. But any car, I was like, any car uh, was a, was a great, but then I had friends who got everything. And now my struggle has been, because my friends that got everything kind of have fucked up a little bit. And I've watched them fucked up. And I've, I remember things like, I remember they got like awesome cars. Like one guy got a Jeep, but he didn't like the rims that were on it. And I went, <laughs> I didn't know you could change out rims. I, I really didn't. I'm 16 years old going, you can get different rims. And so my goal is to make sure my daughters, I, not that they find struggle, that they don't turn into those kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so wait, go back to what your childhood was like. Like, I, I want to, like, because that is fascinating to me because I'm going through some struggles right now where I go, like, we go to plant trees around the wall and I go, I'll do it. And Leanne's like, why would you do it? And I go, because I, I should do it. Like, I, that's what my dad did growing up. My dad did all the stuff around the yard. I should do that. And she goes, yeah, but it would make us more money if you just did a podcast and then we can pay for someone to do the trees. And then you're like, well... I, it's almost like a, I feel like I'm a little lost in the in being a man because I don't really I look at guys putting stuff together and I go I go I couldn't do any of that like I really couldn't yeah yeah well uh growing up my father was the landscaper the maintenance man you know there was no he didn't call anybody and if he called somebody to do it because he didn't know how he'd sit there and watch them do it so he wouldn't have to call him next time. Yeah. So that's like, and we're talking about you and I now, you know, when's the last time you, you fixed the dishwasher? I, you know. <laughs> I mean, I thought you were going to say fix the dish. And I was like, actually I super glued one together. And Leanne goes, Hey, we can't do that. That's not how that works. I super glued a bowl back together. And she goes, no, 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 no. There's no fixing bowls. Cause I really like these bowls. Fix the fucking dishwasher. I couldn't tell you how, where to start. Yeah. So, I mean, things like that, that happened in our house growing up, my father t- took the initiative and, and went with it and fixed it himself because A, there's a sense of pride fixing stuff like that. And B, you're saving yourself a lot of money without you know calling a plumber, electrician and whatnot. Now, I'm not talking to like hook, you know, hooking up lights throughout the house. I'm talking yeah. about little minor things that need your attention uh, now all of a sudden you're on the phone and go, you know, that, that, you know, this needs to be, done. then there's a gardener and, you know, I, I don't, you know, cut my grass, although I cut my grass, I had a business cutting grass at 11 years old. I was allergic to grass and ragweed. <laughs> and my father said, put a mask on and get out there and cut lawns. I had four lawns that, really? I, that, I, that I had in the neighborhood. So I like that sense of like, learning how to earn yeah. responsibility and i'm trying to pass that on to my kids when their life is going to be a little bit easier financially but i still want to you know you know raise them in a not to be the kids you're talking about you know like the, it, it just bums me out when you see those kids that yeah. 
have not had much struggle. And then when struggle shows up, they just, it's like they drop all their weapons and they're like, I, I give up. I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm definitely not ever trying to say that I'm like, uh, I haven't been lucky as shit throughout life. You know, dad paid for college. I didn't have to go take a loan out. Dude, that's the fuck Lo college loans. It's like almost going like, Hey, you want to start life? We're going to just put you back 10 spaces. So you're not going to start life. Even when you think you've started life, you're still back 10 spaces. Mm -hmm. Like that's, fu I didn't have to pay for college and I was in that college for a long time. Didn't study at college. Like there was no like urgency about life. I've been very lucky about a lot of things. I went in for surgery last week and trust me when I say life is fragile. Trust me when I say I, I thought, what if I leave this family? Are they taken care of? Is your family taken care of? That is exactly what this point is. This podcast is brought to you by the ladder and it makes sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a bit each month to protect the ones you love? If you're asking yourself this question right now, choose ladder. Ladder is 100% digital. No doctors, no needles, no paperwork. When you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. You just need a few minutes, a phone, or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithm works in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. If you prefer to talk to a person, their team of licensed agents don't work on, doesn't work on commission. So they're going to help you and not try to upsell you. No hidden fees, cancel at any time. Get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. And Ladder's policies are issued by insurers with long, proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM best finally since life insurance costs more as you age now's the time to cross it off your list trust me i started getting my life insurance when i think i was like 31 so go to ladderlife.com slash bert today to see if you are instantly approved that's l-a-d-d-e-r life.com slash bert ladderlife.com slash bert if you're feeling depressed or struggling with uncertainty or having difficulty sleeping or meeting your goals <laughs> Why are you laughing? I felt, I felt all of those this morning. <laughs> I felt all of those this morning. I feel I'm, like I felt every single one of those. BetterHelp offers online professional counselors who can listen and help. I've been super honest with, I, I wouldn't even call them mental health struggles. I, it, it's so weird. There's such a stigma about therapy and I love therapy. It helps so much. And if you're going through some shit, it's, it's okay to reach out and ask for help. That's why BetterHelp is amazing. amazing. They're going to assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. And sometimes that is the perfect amount of time to ask for therapy, sit back with it for 48 hours, and then talk to a licensed professional counselor securely online. This is not a crisis line. There's a broad range of expertise available that may not be available in your local area. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime, send a message to your counselor, and you get timely, thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, which is I love because you don't have to go to a fucking waiting room. I, I would I went, I did go to one where you had to drive early on. I don't anymore. I would never now personally because I get angry at them if I get stuck in traffic or if I have meetings and then I got to go to therapy. I start resenting my therapist. Eh, that's probably why I'm in therapy in the first place. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed, and that will be needed. I have changed counselors a number of times. More affordable than traditional offline counseling, financial aid is available. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I love BetterHelp because when I check with my counselor, it feels like I like I feel better knowing that they're always there to help me with anything. Our podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash Bert. Visit betterhelp.com slash Bert and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp professional. How long were you in college? Six and a half years. Six and a half years? Yeah, seven wow. almost, really. about, just about... <laughs> Yeah. Number one party animal in the country. I, I, you know, as long as I've known you and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this or told this story many a times, I didn't even know that story about you in college. How did you get voted that? Or how did that become? It was, um, Rolling Stone wanted to do an article about the school. So this one dude called up like five different people, just like, you know, cold calling, president of the school freddie maglione who i grew up with um 
the president of Lambda Chi, uh, Eric Pogue, who was one of my best friends, president of ATO, uh, Charlie Erdman, who was one of my best friends. Just called like five different, the head of scalp hunters. The, he just called like five different organizations. And I had partied with every single one of those guys the night before. Like it just randomly, we had all partied the night before. And so they all thought it was me fucking with them being like, hey, I'm coming out of school. I want to meet like a real party guy. A guy who likes to party. Do you know? And um, I really was that guy. So they're like, oh, okay. Okay, Bert. And like a couple hung up on him and said, Bert. And then Eric Pogue was like, oh, Bert Kreischer party. So hardy. Like as a joke. And this guy's like, I've heard Bert's name four or five times. I'm going to call, get Bert's number. And Eric Pogue gave him my number. And, uh, and he called me and I was in the middle of a bong hit. I was in the middle of a bong hit. Blair Mendez answered the phone. He's like, Hey, it's rolling stone for you. And I was like, sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm like a college kid, you know, like I, there's no way. And I was in the middle of a bong hit. We we're going to go play Frisbee golf. And he gave me his pitch. He's like, you know, I want to see the school. I want to meet everyone. I, 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 you know, I've told that, you know, a bunch of different people and I want to see everything about the school. Can I stay with you for a week? And I exhaled the bong hit and I was like, yep. He was like, were you just doing a bong hit? I was like, I am. I was. He was like, oh, perfect. So he stayed with me for a week. And then when they went to write the article, it just didn't, uh, it didn't pan out. Like it wasn't, it was too, to write about the school didn't make sense. And uh, this guy, Jan Warner was like, what if we just make it about this kid? And so then they shifted it and just made it about me. I didn't know that it was going to be, I didn't know that that was going to happen. They sent a photographer, Nitin Vaducal down to shoot pictures of me. And I thought, I didn't know he was shooting pictures. I mean, I knew I was in the pictures, but I thought he needed someone in the pictures and no one wanted to be in the pictures. Everyone's like, I'm good. This is back when yeah. fame was not something every, everyone wanted. Like people wanted to like be private. Yeah. It's insane <laughs> to think that there was a time. And of course me, I was like, I want to be in the magazine. I was, I was like, one, if I get one picture in the magazine, that would be great. And so, uh, and so I, t- I told this on this uh, podcast the other day. And got emotional. I won't get emotional now. But I went to, for spring break, I went to my uncle's house. My uncle's had a lot of money. And, and he was like in Washington, big successful guy. My dad would kind of sh- farm me off to him and go, Jerry, can you help Bert figure things out? And uh, so my un- uncle brought me up there and to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I interviewed for some jobs. And then Rolling Stone was trying to get in touch with me the whole time. And I was like, that's crazy. And then my dad met me at the airport and he had like all the, magazine things and they sent or they sent me the magazine like the pictures that were going to be in it and i was like my dad's like buddy i think you're going to be in this magazine i think the story's about you and then it came out april 1st and it fucking i mean it changed my life like it it was it was this is going to sound so silly i found out that the valley is infiltrated with um black widow spiders i found that out and i said to my wife there's Two times in my life, there's before I knew about black widow spiders and everything else. Like I was joy and I was happy. And then there's now that I know that black widow spiders are on everything you sit on. And, and it was like, it was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden it was like a shift where that article came out. And I was like, uh, one of my best friend's dads called me and he was like, you're never going to get an opportunity like this. You need to take every full advantage of it. If you've ever wanted to do anything in the entertainment business, now's the time. If you want to do stand up, do it. And then, you know, Oliver Stone's company optioned the rights to my life. And I'm in I'm in college. No money, mind you, but just the option. And you're taking phone calls and like pitching Where stories. You? Where are you in a uh, freshman, sophomore? What? I'm a senior. Oh, you're I'm a, senior. I'm a, I'm a um, this is my sixth and a half. I'm like getting ready to graduate. Oh, this is the end. This is the end. So I did stand up once and then moved to New York. And, uh, and like six months later, Will Smith discovered me. And then all of a sudden I was off to the races. I was like, and then, you know, the, the movie with Oliver Stone kind of falls apart because Will Smith's now, we, we were doing the exact same. Technically, now we look back at it, the exact same uh, sitcom as they were going to do as a movie. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. And I tried to distance myself from it. Like I always looked at like guys like you as um, in awe. Cause I couldn't imagine the bravery it took to say, I want to do this without an article and Oliver Stone and, and all this like heat going into the business. Like it, it didn't take a lot of balls for me to try to stand up for the first time. I and mean, I went and I sold out a club 
the first time my open mic, my first open mic wow. sold out pop bellies. And then, and it was like, and everyone knew me and I've been there for so long. It was like, not of course I was going to kill, but like I could have done, I didn't have to do that great to do good. And, um, and then I look at like Ari, like I, and, and this that Ari is a perfect example, but you're here. So it's, it's, but like the balls it took for someone like Ari to go like, I am funny when he has never and lived in a world where like with in orthodox judaism it's you know it's like don't stand out don't get don't be just shut the fuck up <laughs> and then for ari to go like I, it always blew me away that ari ever thought he should be a stand-up or like you like when you i remember you telling the story about like you got some headshots in chicago Beautiful. and and you, and you came to and but the idea that no one would tell you hey uh you're this is what you got it like no one like rolling stone told me this is what you got to do that you just went i could do this yeah there, there wasn't there, you know everybody gets into the business in their own way um you know it's it's great that you had that huge platform to kind of bust onto the scene um but yeah i mean for for me it was more like uh all right i I like telling stories. I like being funny around my family. Every time I get in front of the class, I tend to make people laugh, but I'm not the class clown. You know, I, I just always love stand-up comedy. And then uh, I did these headshots uh, back in Chicago, and uh, I sent them out before I got out here. And um, and yeah, that was and no one called back. I had no no you know, nothing. I came out here not knowing anybody. I didn't sleep on anybody's couch. I had about 10 grand saved up from working at uh, this place called The Living Room in Schaumburg doing fine dining. And I uh, didn't want to do like, hey, hey man, can I, can I lay on your couch for this week? I, uh, never that guy. I never wanted to be that guy. I was definitely that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sebastian, I used to get I used to get a bag of weed. And when I lived in New York, I get a bag of weed. And then I'd, I'd tell guys that I, I could like, I could read. I would have been a great salesman. I could find guys that were my kind of guys and be like, hey, you guys want to get high? And they're like, fuck yeah. I was like, well, clubs are closing, right? Let's go. You want to go to well, my, my roommate's an asshole. I never roommate. I never roommate. I had a guy whose floor I was staying on who didn't speak English, but I, I didn't have a place to stay really. Like once he went to bed, the door was locked. If I didn't make it in by then, and I was like, all right, well, I just got to find. And I'd go to their house. i go, let's go to your house. My roommate's an asshole. I'd grab the weed. We'd all smoke, and I'd pass out on their couch, and I'd just be like, oh, I guess I'm sleeping here tonight. And they'd be like, buddy, you got to go. Buddy, fuck it. Let him sleep. I did that twice. The second time I did it, I woke up in the morning, and a guy I grew up with is in the living room, John Beamer. He goes, the fuck are you doing here? I go, John? He was like, what the fuck? And I swear to God. And I was like, hey, I don't have a place to stay. He's like, stay on my couch. And then I ended up renting his room. He moved back to Tampa. Um, but wait, so you save money. You come out, you get an apartment. Yeah, see, totally different, man. I mean, you're that guy. You're that guy that just, stay hey, life at a party, this and that. And hey, sleep it out. Sleep it. <laughs> Me, I was like, yeah, I need my own space. I don't want to uh, impose on anybody. So I came out here, got a place up on uh, Hollywood Boulevard and Fuller, right by the um, Fuller, yeah, by the uh, Runyon Canyon. Oh, I think that's where everybody moves when they come out here in '98. So wait, wait, what? what uh, so you moved up there? Tell yeah. me about that apartment. Like, what did you? Well, like, were you living by yourself? Moved in by myself, and uh, first morning I get up, I face a building, and I look out the window, and there's a guy fucking his couch looking <laughs> looking at me and i'm like this is this is hollywood <laughs> so i shut the blinds i would open them he'd be staring in it, it, so i had to go down and i go i, I need another apartment <laughs> sorry you signed a lease so I, I had to sit there for six months in the dark because every time i opened up the the drape this guy was like a peeping tom <laughs> Uh, and then I moved to the other side of the building and, um, yeah, I was there for like two years and then I moved into Wilf working at four seasons, worked at four seasons hotel, waiting tables. And making that's another friends? thing. Make friends there. Were you making friends? Yeah. I was making friends, uh, like work friends. Like we yeah. would go out for a drink after work. Um, and then, you know, trying to do stand up in between the working. And I always grew up with like, 
I, I just needed some cash in my pocket. Yeah. yeah. I'm not good at like uh, starving. You know, I, I need to make money. Uh, so much so where I took another job working, selling satellite dishes in the ghetto on uh, Martin Luther King and Baldwin Hills. Um, I know that, I know exactly what that, that is. Yeah. yeah. I had a kiosk, a dish, a dish network. I was selling uh, satellite dishes in a kiosk on the second floor of that mall. Uh, really? People just walking by. So... I was struggling. I I I, I want. I didn't want to wait tables anymore because I was getting sick of people. I didn't like the like the, the, the four seasons are like the highest of high standard wise. And you know you're not working at Mel's Diner where you could just tell someone you know fuck off and eat the BLT. This was like excuse me the 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 wine glass is not. Um, do you have a thicker one? I got a thicker wine. You know like it'd be those type of requests. And I I gotta get out of here. I start doing satellite dishes. And then I went ten thousand dollars in debt, and then I had to tell my parents that I needed money, which was awful. I had to like, uh, it, it, my mother knew something was wrong with me. Yeah, she said, well, "What's wrong?" I, and then I broke down. I go, "Ma, I gotta tell you, I'm ten grand in debt." And uh, you know what I was doing? I was can't. You know, you ever get those American Express or Visa checks in the mail where like it says thousand dollars, and then you cash oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's what I was doing to survive because if I didn't, I just, I, I had too much pride to, to call home and say I needed money, Yeah, but, but it got to a point where I was like, I got, I gotta, I gotta call home. And, uh, it came out and my dad's like, I give you the 10 grand, but you gotta pay me back. Now this guy kept, I mean, the accounting this guy kept <laughs> on what I owed him. Yeah. Cause I would float them like, here's a hundred dad, or here's, you know, a thousand and here's a 1100, whatever. He had a ledger that he kept of, of the money I sent and what I owed him. You know, like my mother was like, just give him the money. Yeah. <laughs> but my dad's like, no, he's paying me back. And I paid him back every cent. And I'm glad he did that because it got me back to the four seasons, got me working again. And like, Hey, this is what I got to do to survive. And, uh, and that was that, but yeah, I mean, there's been struggles along the way, but the struggles have definitely helped me, uh, with my career. Do you think that I remember, uh, I remember having a job and wanting to, wanting to be, uh, wanting to be the, those like being at a place and wanting to be the people that were at that place, like, like working at the four seasons, you want to be the person eating at the Four Seasons. Yeah. That's actually your entire goal is to end up to be able to go to the Four Seasons and eat because a lot of the people that go there are Hollywood types. Yeah. And then you see the behavior they exhibit and you go, I don't know if I'm in the right race because <laughs> I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the person that calls a chef out and goes, you're better than this. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, I, I can't. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the whole goal is to be on the other side of the table, you know? And, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, that's something to strive for. But, you know, listen, you're not going to be that guy. You're not going to be, you know, like we talked about the kids. The kids ain't going to be those kids because you're not those. You're not that person. I'm not that person. So, you know, with the, with success, I think you definitely, you are who you are, no matter, you know, what type of success you have. What was the, what was it like when you, like, I'm curious to know, like, you seem like someone who's very organized. So like when you'd get an apartment, would you, like, would you, like, what kind of pictures did you put up? Oh, God, if you talk to my wife, she'd be, you know, she, when she first came over to my, my apartment, minimal. Really? Yeah. There's none, there's none of this. I mean, there's, there's, there's none of like the walls <laughs> covered with, with photos. Yeah. The, which is cool. But for me, it was, <laughs> I ain't done. I got discovered like the next Shepherd Fairy, right? I went to a, a mall and this guy was doing um, paintings of like a martini glass with like fun olives coming out of it. Like the olives were like people and they were splashing into the martini. Yeah. I think his name was Godard. And I thought this guy's unbelievable. So I had like. <laughs> and your like, wife's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife would come over. She's like, what is that? I go, it's a Godard. It's a Godard. <laughs> You know, I bought it thirty nine fifty at the mall. 
Um, so I had a couple of these all over the, uh, but not, yeah, you're right. It was this very clean, very minimal, no clutter. Um, everything's. I would, wouldn't it be great? How much would you, how much did you pay for, uh, your first month of dating? If you could get the, if they, if you didn't know this, but they had a nest cam in there where you could watch you and your wife courting, like come bring it back to your house. Say, hey, I'm going to make you something to eat. You know, like I would like you look in, at technology now and you go, you know, you're very lucky in that you're going to have so many pictures of your kids. I had to have, get a camera to mm -hmm. take pictures of my kids. Yeah. And, uh, and then I became obsessed with the camera. I learned about cameras. I got into cameras, film cameras, but like you look back and I, it, not until they were like probably a little older, did we start getting like, you can go on the phone and just go, Oh shit, I can see all their history. But I would love to be able to go back and see like a Nest Cam in my New York apartment. Yeah, right. Like I mean, go back and just scroll and go, oh shit, it's the night my gaps came over. Oh fuck, that was a crazy night. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had a camera when we were doing home run derby to see uh what uh what uh, video of that would have been like. I mean, we uh we Who was who was doing that with us? Because I don't remember uh, only people I remember from that because I didn't know you guys yet. No, I I met I remembered you, uh, Brett, Ren is easy, and and I mean I knew Steve, but that's really it. And like I hear people that were there, and I'm like I don't think I ever knew that person. Like who who else was like, there? I don't know. I, th Mike I think Young, like, Mike Young was there. Mike Young was there. I was Ari ever there? Shafir? Yeah. No. Right. That was not our uh, Ernst. Uh, was Ernst there? Yeah, Ernst was there. Ernst was there. He, that, Brett Ernst is the is a really interesting human being. I, I've had two moments now where people have, have talked. I'm about to talk really nicely about him, but like he'll never see this. He's not the kind of guy that's all over the internet looking for fucking videos on himself. He is so funny to me when he's not trying to be funny. That and he's funny when he's trying to be funny. But to the point where I am crying laughing when he's, he has made me cry laughing when he, and he doesn't know why I'm laughing. He's literally like, what? Yeah. Yeah. He's got the ability. And I don't even, I don't even think he, you might be laughing at stuff that he's probably not even trying to make you laugh. But at. you're the same way. I remember, I remember meeting you and you were gearing up to play softball. And I thought, I thought you were doing a joke. And because I was like, you were like putting on your socks matched and your shoes matched and you had like a wristband. And I thought you were doing a bit. And I said to Steve, I pulled over. I go, who the fuck is that? <laughs> and he goes, oh, Sebastian, he's the fucking best. I go, dude, I'm dying watching him getting dressed. And he goes, oh, no, 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 that's Sebastian. And I went, what? He goes, he's not trying to be funny. And I said, it was just me and you sitting there at one point and I'm, I'm just giggling to myself. I go, what? And he goes, he's a, he's fucking hilarious. He's hilarious on stage. I go, he's like, he goes, he's like Ernst. Like Ernst was taking swings at the ball and he go fucking gun. And you're like, what? Get some. Like just as he, and he wasn't trying to be funny. That's how he swings a bat. <laughs> well, you came in and you were like launching him over to the, the, the and I go, is this guy pro professional <laughs> professional baseball player <laughs> i would love i would love that video of that now just to see that no i because i played i played baseball growing up and i got recruited to go to college to play baseball and uh and then just decided to party but that was the funnest i had the, the, those times to me when no one was working and everybody was just kind of oh. just hanging out and we could do that on a tuesday and literally you called everybody everybody was available yeah, you know, yeah, no, I'll be there in ten minutes. Um, but now the business has got not, this whole thing, the podcasting for you. What does it? What is it for you? I mean, is this something that gives you another outlet for entertainment and storytelling, or like, I, I mean, because because there's a group of guys that looks like they kind of started out with the whole podcasting together. Yeah, and you you're in that group. Uh, what is it for you? What 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 do you get out of it? I think for number one, it's a lot of it is um, it's not there yet. Like it's it's uh, interesting. I'm in a transition. The zooms have not been entirely fulfilling 
in, except for a handful of them where I was like, that was fucking a great conversation with someone I'd like to talk to. For the most part, for me, it's when life gets back to normal, it is an opportunity to hang out with people I don't get to hang out with, like you, like, and sit and just talk, like, and, and hang out. Um, Two Bears, One Cave is, and Bill Burt are different in that, I mean, I love, I love those two guys. And so to watch, I like watching both of them think. And so for me, it's kind of like, I just get to hang out with guys I think are funnier than me and then just giggle. Um, but I, I think, you know, the podcast gave me an opportunity to not have to do television. And that was a, a, the biggest like opportunity. And then I started caring about it. And then I was like, I think this podcast is going to transition a little bit into more of things I'm curious about and comics but like I, i'm I, i've been so focused on just talking to comics because they're just easier to talk to than other people other people you bring in you got to interview them and i'm not the best interviewer but like i can hang out and talk there's a lot of things that i know about you or i'm curious about you that i wouldn't know about a stranger yeah, yeah. like just certain ways of watching you behave where i go well, i want to know about like this but I, I i love it i really genuinely love it like this one is great i had whitney in the other day we did a four hour and 45 minute podcast and I, I i didn't we didn't no one wanted to stop um and also i think the stability during the pandemic of being able to have a job that can pay the bills was super valuable i mean i mean bill doubled ours up me and tom doubled ours up and then we doubled this one up because i think people were looking for content yeah yeah it's a way to connect with your fans. I'm not good at social media. Like I'm good at like Instagram. I can, I can put up some good stories. I'm very vulnerable. I put a lot out there. I think that works on Instagram. Um, but for the most part, I think this is an extension of social media is I'm a better at talking things out. Like if I had a joke, the joke I told you about the earthquake, like if I tweeted that I get so much hate online, yeah, yeah. I don't even want to deal with it. But if I tell it on the podcast, then people go, uh, Oh, uh, that's, that's, it's better when you say it for yeah. me. I'm not a good writing comedian. <laughs> it's better in context, you know, not just like one off on a, th I don't even know why people are, every time I, I see people getting in trouble, they, the tweet got, why, why are people tweeting? What does it give you to, to say to, uh, just what happened to, and again, going back to how I grew up, it was, you said it in the house and that was it. Yeah. Even my father said, don't say anything to anybody about, you know, political views, how you feel on this, how you feel on that. It's just, it's private. It's private. That, that, the, I just said that to someone the other day. We were talking about um, Mina, Mina Harris, uh, Kamala Harris's niece. Oh, yeah. And she was tweeting something. She was tweeting something that, by the way, I, I don't, I didn't think was too horrible. I won't bring it up because I don't want her to have to fucking deal with more shit. <laughs> But like, yeah, cause I, yeah. cause I actually, I like her. I, I like, I really am obsessed with Kamala Harris's family, like fucking ballers, ballers. I don't, I don't and by know. the way, I don't even like saying that because everyone goes, oh, so then you're a Democrat. And you're like, oh, God damn it. I can like everybody, you know, yeah, yeah. but, um, but you don't have to tweet everything. Yeah. You don't, not everything. No, first of all, no one really cares about my opinion about a lot of things. You know, I, I saw, I was just talking to Whitney about this, but like Joe Coy talked, you know, tweeted out the Asian lady that got beat up by the black dude in front of like a fries or whatever it looked like. And, uh, and it, I, I wanted to retweet it. And then I thought, I, I don't, I don't want to deal with the headache of people going, well, then what about that time you made a joke? Yeah, Bert? Yeah. And you're like, I, I, if something's super, super important to me, you know, like someone or my friend get hurt, gets hurt and they have a GoFundMe. I'm going to, I care about it. But like, I try to keep my opinions in my pocket and I wasn't always that guy. And then, and then you don't even know what you put out sometimes. Sometimes you put shit out and then everyone's like, oh, so you're just uh, wasted and your daughters are lighting chairs on fire. And you're like, oh, I guess that's what it looks like. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> but yeah, it, there's, I think, and also I, I think what is crazy and I, this, I was thinking of this today. I think everyone's super hypersensitive because we're not getting to work out material you know, like on stage as much as we normally do. So when you tweet, when I watch people tweet stuff out, that is, you're like untesting, just throwing a fucking, just lobbing a fucking Molotov cocktail out there going, I hope there aren't trees around <laughs> and there's trees <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, yeah. People want to get offended. I, I, I don't never, I'm not, I don't get offended easily. Like when you did the MTV Music Awards, I loved it. 
even stuff where like i don't even th- i don't think you said anything that in my opinion that was at all anything where i'd g- clutch my phone like you know like pearls clutching like oh <gasps> but if you take a big chance i love that shit i love that shit i when someone takes a big swing i don't I can't believe there are people that go, what? Like, I'm the guy that goes, shut the fuck up. Like, Charlie Hebdo? Do you see what Charlie Hebdo? They yeah. fucking cover their magazine. I can't remember what it is. So don't remember, don't hold me to this. But when Charlie Hebdo takes big fucking swings, they're the fucking French magazine that satirized Buddha or uh, Allah, yeah, yeah. and then they shot up the place. And Charlie Hebdo still takes big swings. I just go, shut the fuck up. I was never the guy that in class that got outraged. I'd be like, shit. He's just called the teacher a bitch. Oh, fuck. This is going to be good. Like, who the fuck care? Like, gets that upset? I just don't. Yeah. No, I don't either. I, like, I you tweeted out the cancel culture thing the other day on Instagram, and I retweeted it, and I loved it. I loved it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's all done in the uh, for humor. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not done to, like, oh, I'm going to change the world, this and that. We're comedians. We're just trying to make people laugh, and... Uh, Sometimes I guess people people think that it's more serious than it is. It's just basically trying to put a smile on somebody's face. But I don't know. I don't know where we're going now. Now that stand up is going to be coming back after all this pandemic and everything that happened during the pandemic, I'm very curious to see where people are with some topics that uh, could be brought up in 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 comedy. It's interesting. I think that we're about to run into a real mental health. We're about to see the effects of the mental health issues that were happening. So like everyone being in their house for a year is wasn't good for you, but we didn't get to see that except we saw it online. Now we're going to see it in person and you're going to see a lot of people losing their shit in public because I I do. I I have a hard time around people. Like I I just do. I, like right now we go to the fucking we went to the store uh went to rite aid i gotta go back to rite aid by the way and it was packed and pete no one was it was like people were in line like we were placing bets on horses like they were just in line like regular in line and i'm like and i had to get out of line i had to get out of line and like i just stood outside and i was like why am i i'm just gonna be outside where there's fresh air i don't need to be breathing down someone's neck i i panic and i'm okay like i'm a normal person i can't imagine what's gonna happen it's gonna be fucking an eagles game fucking <laughs> fist fights left and right eagles game yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see where, where I'm, I'm i'm very interested to get back out there and i know you were doing it the, throughout the whole pandemic you were doing stand-up yeah I, ju- I just i don't have like a I'm, I'm i'm like you go about money i'm like that way with work where i go i don't ever i don't even pay attention to what money what price tags are on jobs I like to work. I love to work. Yeah. Like I'm ex- the thing I'm excited about for this movie is like for having a family. Like everyone's like a family. Like I love when the when they go cut. I go, what are we doing next? Do you guys want to go to dinner? Like I'm that guy. <laughs> Do you guys want to go to a room and tell each other secrets over a bottle of wine? Ooh, who wants to talk shit? I want to. I want to talk shit. I love that part. Do you do you get um do you get affected like when you know when the MTV Music Awards and you and you see like uh, someone's going to uh, uh, children are outraged or whatever whoever got outraged yeah. does that affect you yeah i mean it's just like oh what what oh uh, yeah, yeah but i don't respond i don't like getting a, like uh i'm not the guy to to stir the flame yeah and i think if you do then you're opening that whole thing up to more of a bigger thing than it really needs to be um but yeah i just kind of stay away from that whole thing my my sole responsibility right now, and I can't really get bothered by you know Twitter, Instagram, or what have you. I just you know I, I wanna I wanna provide for my family, I wanna hang out with my kids, and you know make people laugh. I mean I, I'm not so, looking for any other. <laughs> I'm not looking to get involved, man. That's it. I was, they were doing. They did this uh, this article. And someone tweeted it. I, by the way, I don't even. I'm not even looking at Twitter anymore. I'm not even on it. I took it all off. I I Go on. I I, t- I, t- I will tweet. Um, I will tweet stuff like uh, I like diet cokes. 
And then every, and then it gets like a thousand. Re- I love Diet Cokes. <laughs> I like pizza. And everyone's like, I think I know where this is going, fat guy. And I'll, I don't mind getting jokes about it, but I don't. There's nothing. There's nothing I need to say to the world that I don't want to say on a microphone. Yeah. And then. And then uh, oh, what was I just about to say? I. Fuck tweeting. Oh, I obviously in the way I've lived my life, whether I've said some regrettable things and sometimes you'll be laying in bed and you'll be like, oh, I said that one time, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like you just out of nowhere. You're like, Gah. and everything is an attempt to make someone laugh always. So it's yeah. never like, I've never stated like a horrible statement. Like this is how I feel about homosexuals. I've never done that, but I've made a joke. Some, we were talking to someone and someone's like, have you ever said the R word? And I went, Are you, is that redskin or retard? And they were like, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I go, I'm just asking. I don't like I, I've said them all. I've said them all just for the record. And then I'm sitting in my pool yesterday and I go and I'm, I'm I woke up with like this panic of all the things I've said in my past and jokes that I've made jokes that are on specials specials that I've made. And I'm late. I'm sitting there and I was like, wait, whatever happened to like, oh, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't assault a child like I'm. Like, I'm a really good person. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't hit my kids. I don't drink and drive. I try to make people laugh. I stay in my lane. I make fucking inappropriate jokes sometimes. But like, whatever happened to that? And I was like, I was like, I think the world still signs up for that. Like, I think the world's still like, oh, yeah, regular people, like your friends at home probably were like, yeah, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. They don't know. Yeah. They don't know. I mean, I, I'm amazed that you're you're in bed at night and all that's going through your head. Do you, oh. Do you st- uh four in the morning panic attacks kick in and i think it's because the booze is going through my system and the sugar (laughs) wakes me up and i go and i'll just sit there and be like what did i say about Meghan markle or like because i don't i've when you do and this is the beauty of you, you you the way you've done your career i'm doing three podcasts a week and so i do so roughly i'm talking for about six hours (laughs) six hours i don't know how one can talk that much by the way i don't think i'm out of interesting stuff to say i'm dead serious so many times i'm like i go and then all of a sudden like you get a hot take i was saying this to someone the other day i go ugh i like i regret it immediately as soon as i said it i regretted it but was talking about we were talking about someone like someone's wife tried to like they were getting it turns into to reese witherspoon i love reese witherspoon i love reese witherspoon but we end up bringing her up me and tom and i just go like have you, i go you ever see her dui video and tom's like what by the way it's that's not even what it is so like i'm not even representing myself fairly there yeah and it's just her boyfriend gets it her husband gets a dui and then she gets in the cop's face and it's just something she would never want brought up again but i just and then i'm like I'm going, Tom goes, what do you do in that situation? That's when I look at it. And I said, that's when I look at the cop and I go, taser, bro. You got taser, render her unconscious. She does not want to be speaking right now. Trust me. She will be happier that she got tased than if this video of her talking gets out. And I'm advocating tasing Reese Witherspoon. And I'm, and then I get in my car and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> like, do I feel that way? Like, and so when I hear someone talk shit about me, like on Rogan or someone, I go, I give them a hundred percent pass. I go, I deserve it. I definitely deserve it. If someone talks shit about me, I go, sometimes if it's good, I'll laugh and I'll be like, mm, you nailed it. You don't know the half of it, brother. Well, you, you seem like you, your filter is it kicks in late. Yeah. Like you don't have it in the moment you go in your car, or you sit in your bed and you're going, the hell did I say that? So, uh, yeah, you just gotta, if you, if you don't want those like sweat, sweaty nights at four o'clock in the morning, soaking wet last night, (laughs) soaking (laughs) fucking wet. I mean, literally my pillow is so wet that if I go home now, I bet it's still wet. (laughs) Yeah. You just have to, you just, I don't know. I, I, I tend to like, I'm, I'm thinking 15, 20 minutes ahead of where I'm going. Yeah, but your your funny is you have a different muscle of funny than I have. You can take something that we've all seen a million times and make it funny. I've said this uh, over and over. I remember we were both renovating our houses at the same time. And 
I was watching a lot of things happen and I was trying to write jokes about it. And you talked about the one thing that I'd seen happen that was driving me nuts, but I never saw the humor in it. And it was the guy is that you're paying the crew and all they're doing is sweeping and you go, and there's this guy with a broom and he's sweet. I mean, you're like, Hey buddy, I paid. Oh, and, I, but the way you did it, I'm sitting there dying going, the fucking guy has been sweeping. And then all my things are like, they all have some sort of Mexican overture or like <laughs> homosexual. Over, like there's <laughs> my angles were all like super right on the nose. And then we had caught a homeless person at one point. Like everything I had was like so over the top and just to, and you just were like the guy. Sweet. Do you remember that bit? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I, the, 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 the contractor, they pulled out, like they get a bit better job. They'll, they'll, they'll skip your property. Yeah. And then, and then I'm like, where are you? No, I'll send somebody over. And a guy comes over and, you know, he's just sweeping and, and he doesn't know English. Or, yeah. I, I, I did that angle where the, you know, the, oh. the, a lot of, a lot of the workers tend to be Spanish. I oh, we have the same ex. workers. We have the same workers that did our house or doing this house. Exact same workers, exact same workers. This was something that I was obsessed with. So the only thing that separated them from us, we lived in our renovation was a louvered door. Oh yeah. Right? We had a louvered door that that had plastic on it, but you could hear them very clearly. So one day I hear them eating lunch and I hear one of the guys, I'm not going to say his name cuz he's here. I see him all the time. And he's doing like this character and they're fucking dying. But it's just like a feminine like character like and I'm and I'm like, "What the fuck?" So I go around the house go out the door i come around i want to see what the what he's doing is he like doing they are crying laughing and you can hear him like doing it and as soon as i come around the corner see them they see me and they stop and i go no 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 it's okay guys i'm a comedian and they're like what i go i'm a comedian and they're like okay i go i tell jokes and and they're like okay so you guys were laughing and they're like yeah i go what were you guys laughing at what were you doing and i realized he was doing a character of me <laughs> And I'm like, and he's like, nothing, nothing, man. We're sorry. We're sorry. And I'm like, and then they said to me, we just don't, we don't know what you do. Like, you're always like in a speedo or like in like, in like no shirt, no shoes. And you just bring men to this room, to my man cave for like hours. And you come out giggling. And that's what he was doing. He was doing an impression of me going, oh, that's so fun. That was the greatest time of my life. And, and I was like, oh, they're making fun of me. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Same guys, same guys. I, I love them. They're fucking great guys. And they see me now and they just, this, the guy that made fun of me, I'm doing a fitting in this room the other day. I'm doing a fitting. There are nine racks of clothing and I'm just changing in and out of clothing. And he is digging a hole, a trench. Oh God. And he's so looking at me getting clothes and he's just giggling, looking at me like, what the fuck do you do for a living? Yeah. And I'm like, I just, and I feel horrible. I'm like, I feel like, I feel like I've, I'm like, I'm like, I should be digging holes. I should be digging my own trenches. I should be out there working with them. Right. Why am I putting on a fucking speedo and having women take pictures of me with a feather boa on? <laughs> this Saturday is a bird dogs weekend for me. This Saturday is my last day home. I am barbecuing. I am in the backyard. I'm in the pool. My cast will be off. I, my cast will be off and I will be wearing bird dogs all day here's what i love about bird dogs they're the most versatile pants you can find they dry quickly they've got an inseam so i can get up early in the morning i will get on the treadmill wearing my bird dogs i'm wearing red white and blue either that or sear sucker um i haven't even checked out their new ones i'm still rocking the ones i got from like two summers ago i've broken them in so they feel like perfect i'll get on the treadmill i'll work out i'll get in the sauna I have a polar plunge being delivered. I will get my polar plunge with my bird dogs. And then what I'm going to do is sit by my fire pit, have an early day drink and a cigar, and they will dry off perfectly. Then I'll hit a grill. And throughout the day, I'm going to jump back in the pool and go back and grill, have another drink. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to celebrate life because I'm alive and I'm here and I'm comfortable in my motherfucking bird dogs. These are great dudes. They hit me up one time and they're like, hey, man, let's shoot some bird dog footage. You want to go wakeboarding? And I was like, fuck yeah. They're cool dudes. They sent me all the shorts and they these are my summer shorts that I wear. I got the higher cut because I like to show my legs off, but they have got a lower cut too. The higher cut looks cooler, especially if you have fucking dope ass legs like me. Go to birddogs.com and enter the promo code BERT and they're going to throw in a free bird dog whistle tip football. I do not have the football, but if I had it, I'd throw it over my house to my daughters. 
you'd hear it coming, baby. It's exactly like those Nerf football whistle tip footballs that you had as a kid. This is the must have beach toy of this summer. That's birddogs.com. Use the promo code BERT and boom. Free bird dog whistle tip football with your pair of bird dogs. The bird dogs are the more important thing. Get your bird dogs. You're going to love them. You will not take these things off. I'm going to fucking promise you that. Well, you can take them off at the end of the night when your wife goes, you look so fucking hot in those bird dogs. And you're like, yeah, you want what's inside of these? And she's like, oh, and then you take them off. She's like, who let the dogs out? Who? Who? That's a little extra bird dogs. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> yeah, those are the moments where you, you're doing something like that and you got a man outside doing like work and I, I tend to go, he must be looking at me going, look at this pussy. Right? I think that's so much, Sebastian. <laughs> Not about you, <laughs> but about me. <laughs> we just put in my sauna and they and my, my guy uh, dug a hole for the electrician. And the electrician comes out and he goes, oh, the holes, the trench is the wrong way. And he goes, I'm going to have to just do like a temporary one and then we'll have him dig the trench. And by the way, it is um, it is an eight foot trench. That's all it needs. It just needs an, an extension of eight feet. I said, why don't I dig it? And he, both of uh, uh, the the electrician said, you can't. And I said, no, I can't. And he goes, no, it'll take you forever. And I was like, I can dig a hole. He's like, okay. I couldn't start the hole. I couldn't. <laughs> I'm in flip-flops trying to get a, oh a spade God. into the fucking thing. And I'm like, and I'm looking at this trench that Doug, and I'm like, how the fuck did he do it so good? Like, how the fuck did he get? He got deep. He's like a foot. Dude, they dug a six-foot hole one day. A six-foot hole. And I'm this is like the simple shit. Digging a hole. We kill, All our chickens died. I had to dig deep enough so that our dogs wouldn't dig up our chickens. I couldn't get them. They're all in shallow graves. All our chickens are in shallow graves. I didn't even know you had livestock on the property. Oh, we have chicken. We had chickens. They got killed by a fucking. By what? By a um, possum. And oh, then they, possums yeah. kill chickens? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Possum killed two of our chickens. And then, and you want to talk about editing yourself and going, maybe I won't put that out there. We come home one night and our two dogs have caught the possum and are holding him hostage in our living room, just staring at him, and he is playing possum, playing like he's dead, and they're toying with his body, and I come in, I grab my camera, I start filming it, I'm like, our dog's got our fuck, got the guy, got the thing that killed the chickens, and then I shoot this whole thing, it's great, everyone's like, that's amazing content, and then one person goes, I wouldn't put that online, I was like, why? And they're like, I don't know if PETA's gonna like that video of your dogs toying with a possum, and I was like, uh, I, don't, I don't need it, you're right. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> fuck it. The, the one person that says it. One part. all you need is just one person to go. I don't know, man. You're like, good call. Good call. <laughs> Save me a fucking headache. I didn't see the angle. I didn't see the angle. Oh man. I I stuff like that is like real stuff. It's not like you you know what, what's your dog caught a possum. And maybe I was like cheering him on. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was like, I was celebrating the fucking frontier justice that happened in my backyard while we were gone. I was definitely hammered. Oh. <laughs> well, no, you're on that Instagram. Like we're getting like a feed on your life uh, daily. I have tried to pull it back. Oh, you have? I have. Well, except for when I drink, it just gets out there and out there and content I find interesting is not interesting. But then when you do i i feel like lately my numbers have been really high on my stories so i go all right well lean into the high numbers yeah but um yeah i, I, I i'm trying to pull it back i'm gonna be pulling it back majorly coming up well this is gonna be an interesting you're going to another country to film a movie and uh you're gonna be gone for how long three months three months so is, is your family not coming out there or you're not gonna see your family for three months no i'm and this is what a creep i am i told my daughters they have to give me a hundred hugs within the next week and i was like i'm counting them down i told i came up with this last week they're still at 99 <laughs> <laughs> no they're not coming out well they were gonna but i was it's just it's with covid everything's so complicated yeah, not worth it and uh yeah i wouldn't do you have tour dates yet Starts at the end of May, Memorial Day in Las Vegas, and then we we have ninety one dates. But who knows? You know, who knows if this is going to even happen? So until then, 
you know, just hanging out at the house. Um, what are you guys doing tonight? Like, I'm curious, like, tonight, like, I look at your life sometimes. Like, you don't share enough on Instagram. Like, I love when I see, like, I love when you guys are making dinner. Like, those are my favorite ones. Cause I, yeah, it's funny. I'm not a guy that just reaches for the phone and go, get this. It, it, it cannibalizes your ego. Like, it cannibalizes your life. When you start seeing th- stuff, like uh, the girls lit a chair on fire and they didn't know it, they just walked away. And I see the chair on fire. I grabbed my phone before the hose. <laughs> like I went, and then someone's like, how did you get that shot? Why wouldn't you put it out? And I was like, oh, good call. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, tonight is uh, what, Monday? You're going to go home. Um, what, do you got, what do you got the rest of the day? I got, uh, I'm in the movie super mario brothers an animated movie so i'm real playing um spike their boss yeah so i'm gonna do that at 12 uh i just dropped off my son before i came here to his little pod i have a covid test at two o'clock uh because i'm going to mexico and they need covid tests for that with the family uh yeah i'm going to um i got a gig there 60th birthday party oh for real outside who? I bet who's that guy? I don't even know who the guy is. Uh he's uh I don't I don't get into like who the who the people are until I kind of get there. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean I, I know I, I broad strokes and I know, you know, it's not a it's not a a, a cartel uh dealer. <laughs> um, How great it would be <laughs> if it was El Chapo. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan, man. <laughs> But uh, yeah, today I work out at night. I'll probably work out at night and then uh, just relax a little bit. I'm tr- I'm trying to get, get caught up. I was doing the show for seven weeks. I, I didn't watch any like shows or we were watching uh, Your Honor on Showtime. We had to put that oh, kibosh yeah. on that because I had a bedtime. See, when I get like a job, like a movie or a TV thing, I'm like in bed like at oh. eight. <laughs> at eight. You know, I put my kids to bed and then I go to bed. So, what, and then how do you fall asleep? You just close your eyes and it just. Oh yeah, goes. no, I I I was going to bed at eight eight thirty. This whole this whole string, like when when you were saying, hey, I hope I don't have to wake up with a hangover to do a more. I don't even. I couldn't operate like that. I I, uh, I wake up with a hangover and the day is shot. There's no like working through that for me. <laughs> yeah, you know, dude, <laughs> I wish. You could have seen me this morning. I came in pre-workout. I work out at seven. And uh, and I, at five, I, I I woke up with searing heartburn. Like, like, a, like where I actually thought, maybe I'll just go throw up and get it out of my body. Searing heartburn, fall back asleep, wake up with a panic attack. And I go, I am, I drank too much yesterday to get through to tomorrow. So like, I go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel I said, what's important? Sebastian, Eddie, and that's that's really oh, and this this dentist appointment with Isla, the virtual Zoom. And so I go, all right. So I, I go, I got to cancel working out. Now my brain goes, don't cancel working out. You know for a fact, as bad as you feel, if you work out hard as fuck, it goes away. So you just got to deal with getting up, getting into the shower. I like to shower on those. I like to shower before I work out on those days, shower, get up, shower, make a cup of coffee and get over there. Just get over there. And there'll be a point in this workout where you say to yourself, I have one more set. And when you do, you're going to feel perfect. Dude, I was a fucking mess. I came over here sweating through the activations of just re- like moving my neck around. I, then we're, and we're all doing like heavyweight lifting by the end, we're doing 300 meter rows in under a minute and shoulder presses, 12 shoulder presses. And that's how we're ending it out, just repping it out until you can't go anymore. And I am fucking pouring sweat. But I'll tell you right now, I feel like a million bucks. It, it all goes away. It goes away entirely. In, I don't have one bit of hangover in my body at all. It And I said to Lacey, my trainer, I said, she goes, she could see I was rough. Uh, like i came in i didn't really talk and she was like you just gotta tap into your mickey mantle gene she was like you just gotta push it she's like you're different just push it and so she kind of think she maybe made the end because the rowing rowing i ran i rode two thousand meters to to start are you talking the rowing machine yeah oh yeah that's that's awful two thousand meters to start as a warm-up and then we did 
seven and then we did boxing we're doing boxing training and then do uh uh 10 push-ups 10 dips 10 push-ups 10 dips 10 push-ups 10 dips then shoulder presses then uh fucking the rows where you have the weight on the ground and you got to lift it off the fucking thing and then squats and then i mean it was like and i feel perfect right now and that's the bad part is that's why i want to drink i'll end up drinking with eddie because i feel so good right now well it, to, so you've hired this trainer yeah you, you're, you're getting in shape but are you uh all- kind of well, I, mean, I, have, I have exact, I have parameters on how good I can get in shape. Well, what, what is, uh, what are we doing? What, what are we doing the trainer for? What, is this for the movie? Yeah. It's because if I don't have some sort of game plan in line, I balloon up. Like if you just leave me to my vices, like, like we, I do go big show, I show up there and I'm doing good for the first week. And then the first night Snoop wants to party and I realize I got access to Snoop. I'm partying every fucking night. So have you partied with Snoop? Yeah. What is that? Uh, take me into that den. Oh, it's awesome. Is it just hanging around, smoking pot? What's, what's yeah. the vibe? He's always got a blunt in his hand. Great music. He loves to play music and listen to great music where you go like, all of a sudden you you hear something he's listening to. And then the next morning at your workout, you're like, I'm going to deep dive that. And then you, then you find like a whole thing. I mean, sadly, a lot of it is me picking his brain about being a mogul like being as big as he is and hip-hop i always want to know about hip-hop so like it was just me hammering him about hip-hop and then and then what when we partied with cody like when if cody was involved it was none of that it was cody cody rhodes uh you know dusty rhodes wrestler oh yeah yeah. it's his son oh okay and he's fucking awesome he's on the show and so if it was me snoop and cody it was just cigars bullshit snoop likes he loves to reminisce like if you like it's really cool. If you're like, remember football pencils? He's like, oh shit, football pencils. And you're like, and then you just reminisce about the, like, he's, he's just a great dude. Yeah. Like a really solid dude. And, uh, and so as soon as I, I could party with Snoop and then, you know, Snoop lives a certain lifestyle that it's, he's a racehorse. He can't keep up with like eating wise. Like he'll eat, he eats whatever the fuck he wants and doesn't gain weight. And I'm not that guy. So I found out that he was eating oxtails and not getting the delivered lunches that we got like prepackaged lunches, you know, yeah. fish, a rice. And, and I go, Hey, what's for lunch today? One day to him. And he goes, who gives a fuck? I said, when he goes, I don't eat that bullshit. He's like, I eat oxtails. I go get a soul food restaurant every day. And I went for real. He goes, yeah, you want that? And I was like, fuck yeah. And I, at the finale, I am unrecognizable. I'm so fat. So, and I stopped working out. I started partying every night. So I got to get on a program just to keep myself at like 235. Just to keep myself at 235, I got to work out pretty hard. Okay, so then you're going to go and do the movie. So mm-hmm. are you continuing that workout on the movie? Same trainer. All the gym equipment's been delivered to my house there. And then uh, and she's going to write up workouts. Now that I know the workouts, she can write up the workouts, send them to me. And then if we have any questions, Zoom. And, uh, and, then, and also, I think it was getting myself to a place where I got excited. Like, I, I benched 235 the other day. Oh, and I was, that two plates on each uh, side? Yeah, the two, well, two. I have different types of weights. So I have, I have 45, or I have 50 pound weights, or 45 pound weights. And then, ten, like, I, oh, it's, it's, it's a 10 pounds more than a normal plate? I think so. I, whatever, whatever, whatever it was. Go back to Florida. Remember, 235 in Florida was, was two big plates on each side, right? That's 225. Is two, oh, 225. Two, that's right. I was explaining. I was explaining. So, do you lift weights growing up? Like, with like. Oh, yeah. That's like, what we were, you know, 220. Put two, you know, slapped it on. People got around. It was like, you know, you got on the edge. <laughs> 225 is the threshold. Like, okay. So, I was trying to explain this to, because I had a very visceral reaction like like body wise like my body kind of shut down that day and i ended up and i had ended up having like it was like a release of energy so two years ago we were at joe's studio and i said throw 225 on i can always put up 225 and i got pinned under it Mm. and i was like oh shit i am now turning into an old man and it was really depressing because then joe did it 10 times and i was like ugh. And so the other day we've been doing bench press, but not bench. We waited for the rack. The rack shows up. And she goes, let's, let's max out bench today. And I was like, fuck man, 225. I was like, and I tried to explain to my wife, maybe you can explain it 
Do you remember the progression of when you first started lifting weights? When you look at other boys doing it and you'd be like, God, is that what? That's 135. That seems like a lot. I'm doing just 35s on each side, not 45s yet. And then, and then when you'd grow from 45s, it would go 45s with 10s on. And then 40, like you'd do three sets. First was like a warm up with 25s on. Then you put on 135. That's 45s on each side. Then you'd put 10s on. Then you'd put fives on. And then that was like, okay, that's your workout. Now it's good time to go to incline. And then, but that growing up to get to like bench 200, bench 225, mm -hmm. it's like, it's a rite of passage. Yeah. And then when you can't do it, I mean, I, I, if I put 225 on there, there's no way I'm getting it off my chest. No way. I, I might lit. You ever you ever pick up the weight and right right away you're like yeah they, they ain't like not even try like when you picked up two twenty five in your head you were like I can't do this I was, or did I, you find out when you got down I found out when I got down and I couldn't get it off my chest and I was and I had like and I it was it was it was very tough pill to swallow so yes two two days ago I'm I'm trying not to pay attention and luckily my trainer is really bad with adding up weights sometimes which is an odd thing to be bad at if you're a trainer. Yeah. And she says, all right, that's 185 that's on right there. And it felt light. And I went, ooh, wow. She goes, okay, that's 205. And I'm looking at it like, oh, I don't think that's 205 in my head. But I'm like, all right, I'm going to whatever. So I do it and it still feels light. She goes, I'm going to put on 225. But she put on 235. And I looked at it and I was like, that's not 225. In my head, I was like, I haven't done 235 in a very long time. Let alone if I get, I go, I can't let my head, I need to know the exact weight. Like I needed to. And so I said, I don't think that's 225. She goes, no, it is. I said, no, I, I don't think it is. My wife's there. She's like, you got this, hon. It's my wife, my trainer and me maxing out bench. Dude, I got it up. And it was almost like all of a sudden I felt like there was possibilities for everything. <laughs> I got so, so. So you do 235 four times four i did it four times wow yeah and i was like i was like this is fucking and then i said to her today i was like just you know we're getting 250 up before i leave for serbia and then because then if i'm if i'm i'll tell you right now if i throw up 250 i will do 100 push-ups every single fucking morning i will do because then you're incentivized to work out because your body's already fixing itself yeah and then you and then i don't know anything about weightlifting so you're i'm texting joe and tom like is is we're doing deadlifts and i go is is 205 or 305 good for a deadlift and they're like who the fuck's doing that and i was like me and they're like liars in the video and i was like here you go like i got i'm obsessed with it now so i'll so i'll be she'll be send me a workout and i'll be like excited to do a push-up like i want to do 40 push-ups in a row to see if i can do it for tom because tom doesn't think i can do it and i'm like uh i think i can do it i don't know if i can do it i used to be able to do 100 in a row wow that's amazing what we used to do when we were younger. And now, you know, how old are you? 48. All right, 47. Yeah, there's no way. I do um, 35 each side. Nice. Maybe. and uh, Or less weight, more, more reps. reps. Because I got shoulder. Don't You have no ailments? No. Isn't that crazy? Ah, yeah, that's, uh, I got elbow and shoulder chest. you look in you're in good shape i'm in all right shape I, I i i believe me over the pandemic i was looking at myself going wow this is embarrassing <laughs> so uh, january 1st my wife and i said you know let's let's, let's oh, that's right you guys stopped yeah, boozing stop boozing are you uh, still not boozing uh weekends you know friday saturday just bottle of wine we split it it's not like you know i was never like a blitz drunk type of guy but there's nights during the pandemic where you know a little bit more than i should be drinking wake up You've got nowhere and, to go yeah hung over my hangovers are like they're not good they're, they're crippling they're, they're nothing like uh i'm gonna do a workout and sweat it out i've been there <laughs> I've done a workout in a steam. I come out and I'm in worse shape. <laughs> that's not, that's not me. I, last night I said, last night I had, I know that I had one, I, they opened a bottle of wine as if we were all going to drink it, but I was the one that had that bottle of wine. And the last sip I went, you know what? I'm going to save myself. And I put out the sip and my wife goes, really? You think that's going to make a difference as, as opposed to the whole bottle of fucking wine? And I was like, well, it, every little bit helps. <laughs> Searing heartburn. 
<laughs> it's coming, you throw up in your throat, and you spend the rest of the night trying to get the throw up out of your throat. <laughs> Fuck. I wish I could just get in the weed this way. <laughs> oh, my God. I wish, uh, I, here are the things I wish. I wish I had gone to dinner at your house with your wife that you guys did the thing and you invited us and I so badly wanted to go. What thing was that? You guys did like a pizza party or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I so badly wanted to go when I, I think I was out of town that week. And, uh, and oh, we'll have another one. And I so badly want your dad to tell me how to cut my hair. <laughs> I want him to cut my hair and go, okay, just so you know, this is what you should be doing. My dad just had uh, uh, shoulder surgery, right? And he's 74, he's got still cutting hair. 74 years old, still cutting hair, and he gets the surgery. He goes, it takes six months to recover from the surgery. Ooh. So he goes, yeah, when I go back, I go, go back. Dad, it's over. <laughs> it's hang it up. Yeah. But this guy wants to go back to work at a, a limited capacity and still cut hair with like half an arm. I go, and he goes, I can't retire. This guy's 74 years old. And he's in a business where this ain't an old man business, you know, like, yeah, yeah. he's not a barber. Yeah. He's a hairstylist. Yeah. So when you walk into like a Beverly Hills salon, you don't see an 80 year old man <laughs> cutting hair, right? <laughs> That's what my big dad wants. Taking to his arm out of a sling. All right, let's go. <laughs> so, uh, well, my dad, my dad's coming in May, uh, and, and maybe, oh, you're going to be gone. But wait, we'll have you over. We're I would love over. that. I would love to have your dad cut my hair and go, oh, this is what. Like, because I, I I used to cut my own hair. I, I could cut hair. I used to be able to cut hair legit. Um, I, so I One of my OCD things I love, I love fucking watching people get their hair cut on Instagram, especially Puerto Ricans. Poor, I, if I had a, a passion project, I'd open a barbershop in a Puerto Rican neighborhood and just cut like 15-year-old Puerto Rican boys' hairs. <laughs> It's just i i would I, if if i could if you like give me a charity i would open up a barbershop inside a prison and just cut the latino hairs that's it just, just love latino hair i don't know man i i just get obsessed with it it's like it's uh, for whatever reason you know the good videos or they come in and they've got they need a haircut and their beards all over the place and when you, you it's it's a real cinderella story like it, you see them go from like just looking messy and like a kid or whatever to like looking as sharp as fuck. Yeah. And you're like, God damn it, man. You went from fucking f zero miles per hour to a hundred. And I don't know. It's I know, nothing ever does it. Like I, I can't watch black dudes get their hair cut when you cut off dreadlocks. It breaks my heart. I go, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to miss them. And then now you just look like a, like a fucking regular guy. I would love to have dreadlocks. Oh, no, not me. Oh, no. I, I feel the same way when they do the homeless guy. You ever see where they do the homeless guy? He comes in and he's got a just beard. Yeah, but then he smiles hair. and his teeth are all fucked up. So. <laughs> no. These Puerto Rican kids got great smiles. <laughs> <laughs> well, the transformation is so drastic. You're like, oh, wow, there's a real person under there. There's <laughs> a real person under there. <laughs> no, because sometimes, you know, it's like it's the hat and the hair yeah. and this and that. And they clean them up and it's like, wow. I would like to take care of homeless people's feet. See, that's my, my that's my other thing is is I love my feet are killing me. Have you ever seen that show? No. Oh, my feet are killing me is like one of my favorite shows. What's it on? Like a Discovery? It's on Discovery. Yeah. It's about TLC. It's just people with feet problems come in. And I, for whatever reason, I'm obsessed with like anything skin. There's this one guy that had like these warts on his feet. <sighs> Can't I'd spend it. hours doing that. I would spend, I would, that's when you feel like, when I say that I don't feel like I, I love this job because it never feels like work, mm, cleaning feet, I think, would be something I would never feel like work. Really? Uh, oh, wow. I might be, I would I would have been a great dental hygienist. I like watching plaque get removed off teeth. Well, actually, I think you, you did something on your own foot on Instagram where you took like, uh, your foot literally looked like a, like a rhinoceros. It gets it, so bad. My left foot, and I don't know why my left foot, but it gets so cracked and dirt gets in it because I'm barefoot all the time. Yeah, it's it's like it's, it's athlete's foot. No, it's not athlete's foot, right? Is that what athlete's foot is? Have you seen a podiatrist? No, I've never been to a podiatrist. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? 
I'm gonna let my foot. I just gotta reach reached out from Dr. Ebony from my feet are killing me. Her people reached out. They're like, we'd love to have her on the podcast. I should let my feet go to shit and then have her take a look at them and analyze them. Hey, again, I'm not Mister Facts. You know, like yeah. it's like like we go on Joe Rogan's show. I feel like I'm ill-equipped to respond to any topic because I'm I'm not well read on it. <laughs> or, right? or or for me, I'll end up reading a book and then getting on there and you can it's clear I read one book and I'm like, have I ever told you about King Leopold? <laughs> <laughs> oh well. So don't quote me on this, but I believe that like cracked heel ash uh is is a is a form of athlete's foot. Then I fucking got it yeah because this my left heel i just shaved it last night oh it looks perfect right now it looks really good right now my right one is never gets done well you have you bet you have great feet (laughs) i bet you have great feet. i have a nice nice foot i don't have toes for a sandal and what i mean by that looking at your feet your your toes are long enough where you could put it in a in a sandal and it looks good i got like flintstone feet where it looks like somebody hammered them out and they're <laughs> they're short they don't have length to them i bet lana's got great feet <laughs> grew up in florida anyone who like they people in florida people out of florida, florida feet, have yeah. great fucking feet yeah she's got great feet but she's got she has a bunion so her you know her oh, really her, her toes move into the nikki glazer's got a bunion Oh really? Yeah, and I and I and I, it's, it's crazy. I know I know the guys who have bunions. <laughs> I keep up on feet. Um. All right, I gotta. Yeah, I gotta let me get you out of here. Uh, Super Mario, dude. Thing. This is awesome. This was great. Hey man, I hope I uh, hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, and uh, we'll have you over after this movie's over. Please, I would love that. I would love that, and just keep posting more of your dinner videos. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you more more. I'm gonna need shots. a lot of content to get me through this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. it. Take care.